Hello. Hey. It's no fun that you have the scroll unless you teach the rest of us how to do it. <laughs> yeah, there's a squirrel on your shoulder. No, my other shoulder. Up there? No, your other, other shoulder. Oh, that shoulder. Yeah. Up there? All gone. So I tried to do one of my drone videos as a uh, background. Way too big. Yeah, the files are huge because it's high, very high res. Yeah. Because yours is a 4K too, right? It's a 4K and supposedly on certain shots I can get 8K, so. Yeah, you can compress the videos. There's a cool app called Handbrake that will compress them to get the file sizes down without losing quality. Yeah, but Facebook also reduces the quality tremendously. You will not have, it won't be 4K when you upload it to Facebook. They, they automatically compress everything. You're right, yeah. And they crush the quality. So was, if, you, if you want to retain the quality, you're better off uploading it to like a Vimeo or a YouTube and then sharing it. Yeah, you're right. Sometimes I am. All right, I think we have successfully managed to go live. Now I just have to go find the live feed on my Facebook page because heaven forbid it would actually take me there after completing the process of going live that would just be way too easy hey tiff hey greg hey everyone tiffany's here i am tiffany <laughs> this sound like timmy all right good morning happy friday it's june 26 2020 and we are live with uh <laughs> i almost said the very old version of what we used to call these accountants, bookkeepers, and business owners. Anyway, it's the Friday morning Zoom in with Seth, David, and friends. In case we you wouldn't were wondering, want to call it that. I'm Seth, David, <laughs> and you are all my friends. I'm a lucky guy. So this morning I wanted to talk about something. It might be actually kind of short and sweet, and then we can talk about some other things, what I want to show you, but I'm, I'm sure that our bank feed master maestro with the squirrel is going to have some input for today. Squirrel. So one thing, one thing I was looking for, and Matthew, maybe you know the answer to this. I thought I had read or seen somewhere that you could actually share bank feed rules between companies natively in QuickBooks Online. Maybe not, or maybe it was something they talked about doing but haven't done yet, or tried it and it didn't work, or something. It's on the project roadmap. Oh, okay. it's a really long road. It is a really long road. Okay, I, yeah, I, I wasn't sure. I was looking around because I, I remembered reading something about it, and then I was like, so I was looking around this morning. I was like, I don't see a way to do it, but maybe I'm missing something. You know, sometimes these things can get buried in the like navigation in places you would never expect to find. It may be on the way because, I mean, they've obviously changed kind of the look of the rules nowadays. Um, so that could be taking steps in the right direction. They're changing a lot of things. Like I've seen in a few client files, the bank feed area looks all different too now. Yeah. And then I've seen the navigation where it seems sales has gone away and it's been replaced with something else. Invoicing invoicing right which i feel like that might be what was originally there or something i don't know i kind of like sales better i feel like that better describes the global you know range of what's inside there but what do i know i don't know anything i'm just a guy drinking his coffee on a friday morning well can we can we pause for a minute and and pause for a dennis stretch oh yeah dennis let's see it there it is. All right. <laughs> okay, now we can stop. My Friday morning is ready to go now. I'm glad you said that, Greg. I almost forgot. I almost completely forgot. Um, okay. Like... <laughs> well, in a way, I'm glad that that feature isn't around yet because I and, – and even if it was around, I was still prepared to discuss why what I'm going to show you today I think still might be useful, maybe even more useful. Um because I don't know how the sharing is going to work when you can do it. But my guess is it's going to be, I don't know, maybe you would have to pick it off rule by rule from one company and share it to another. 
Anyway, I don't imagine, and I could be wrong, but I, I wasn't guessing there would be some central library of rules that you can pull from, and that's what I wanted to talk about today is how to kind of create exactly that, like a central library of rules. And Airtable is the perfect tool to do it in because with Airtable, you can uh, do all kinds of wonderful things to categorize because you're not going to want all rules for every company. You might want to be able to sort of pick it based on what your needs are. And it's been a little while since I've done anything in Airtable on these Zooms. So I also wanted to take the opportunity to kind of show you some of the really cool stuff Airtable's been doing with, well, with Airtable. So we're going to kind of start from scratch. And here I have a, uh, a sample company where, based on a previous video I did, I have a bunch of rules in here that I kind of imported. And by the way, before we even get to the library thing, you know, these things can get messy over time. And so if you ever want to just like clean the rules up, then um, the great, uh, there's a great way to do that, which I'll show you in a second. But while I'm sharing my screen, I need to bring the participants window up and the chat window so I can kind of see what's going on here. Wow, nobody's been in the chat so far. That's unusual. Very unusual. We're busy listening to you. Imagine. Don't listen to me. You should not listen to me. That's a mistake. All right. So one thing you can do is you can export all these rules into an Excel file to kind of clean them up and, and then re-import them, right? And why would you do that? Because it's easier to work with them in Excel than it is in this screen. You can't, can you now sort by rule name? No, you can't sort by rule name because the order of these rules is very important actually, because if you have rules whose settings sort of conflict, then the rule that's on top will win. That will take precedence over the rule that's below. So the order of these is very important to consider, especially if you do have sort of overlapping rules. Now, let me see if I have one of my favorite ones in here. If not, I'm going to create a new rule. Oops. You do have the filter at the top where, um, like one of the things when we do naming conventions for rules just for a situation like this is we'll usually do the first two initials so we know who made the rule, dot, then we'll do the um, account we want it to go to, then dot, and then the vendor name. So you can do a search and pull up any of that stuff very easily, and you always have a unique name that way as well. Cool. So I was just deleting. There were some rules in here that I got an error message for because they were referencing elements that didn't exist or didn't exist anymore in this QBO company. So now I think I'm there. Yeah. Now I want to see something because I thought I had done a rule. All right, so we're going to create one of my favorite rules to demonstrate and I actually demonstrate this in the Bulletproof Bookkeeping course. So I'm going to give away something very high value for free here. And Tiffany says, Matthew, that's a really good idea. If Tiffany says it's a really good idea, then it's definitely a really good idea. I always listen to what Tiffany says. So here's a really cool example of a rule you can create. Um, that I love to do. So we're going to call this Honda lease. And the reason I'm just picking Honda mainly because the, the client that inspired this had a lease with Honda. Funny how that works. So basically what we want is, and I wish you could expand this dialogue a little more. This is the new kind of create rule dialogue, right? This is, or at least it seems newer. Um, so this is an all inclusive, you know, kind of rule set right? I never do description. I always do bank text. I find oftentimes when I do description, the rule doesn't get applied, but bank text is always very reliable. So we're going to create the rule based on the bank text containing the word Honda. Now where this is coming from is my client had a lease with Honda and that lease was a set amount every single month, but he would also take his car to Honda for repairs. And so what happened is one month we were reviewing his financials, his P&L totaled by month, and his lease expense was missing from the lease line item on the P&L. And I said, well, I know we reconcile every month, and I know, so I know it's got to be there somewhere. Turns out the lease payment landed in the auto repairs and maintenance. 
because that's that was I think the I don't know if that was the rule that was applied or that was just what was you know left for QuickBooks to figure out because that's where most of the charges with Honda had been going and I said wait a minute we need to distinguish and I can distinguish very specifically where the amount equals I think the lease was like six hundred and ninety five dollars for whatever he had leased from Honda so the point is when it when it's that exact amount I know that's the lease expense right so we're gonna do auto lease And I just, I don't feel like the detail type matters at all anymore, but I still find my OCD tells me I have to take the time to find the right category. I have a lot of other business expense. Yeah, I feel like there's auto. I knew there was an auto category and I wish you could resort them or do something to make it easier to find what you're looking for. Um, all right, save and close. And the payee of course is gonna be Honda. Okay, I know a lot of you like to do this one and what happened? Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so that's not working. Maybe it'll work after the fact. Um, so I don't like to turn this on. I always like to review these things. What if his lease payment changes, right? Well, then it wouldn't catch it. Tiffany says, stupid question, I know, but can you hear other sound? I don't understand. Dan, she's talking with Dan. Dan's having a hard time with the sound. Oh, I'm, oh, oh. Not you. It's not me, it's not you. you. It's right, it's me. Okay. So Tiffany, I'm just you're on the wrong microphone. Two cents worth in this. I never set up auto leases as a bankroll because I know that I have a lease agreement. My lease agreement is for a set period of time. So then I always set my leases, my commercial leases, my loans, all that sort of stuff as recurring entries or recurring transactions. So they'll so just match if up. They're ever, if it's ever like they take too much or they change the number on me where it's separate from my con my legal contract that I know of right away. Yep. No, I agree. That's a good idea. I liked this in this particular client's case because I know that I review his financials with him regularly. I actually meet with that client once a week. So... I like this way of doing it only because I know that we're reviewing. So the second that lease payment changes, or actually, as it turns out, he um, he actually, because of COVID, he doesn't need his car right now. And it happened that his lease was up. So he just turned the car in and didn't get another one for now. <laughs> um, so that's fine because the payment won't show up in the bank feeds anymore and we can kill off that rule. But that is a very good point. You can definitely... You know, that's the other way to do it instead of a rule when you know the amount is going to be exact every month. My only question, though, is if somehow it's going to be possible that the rule that you might have for the, all the rest of it, the auto repairs and maintenance might kick in and supersede the matching of the lease payment with that transaction. And I forget, but I've seen where in the bank feeds, it doesn't apply the rule that I'd want to apply necessarily. If it has some other idea, it seems about how it should be matched. I don't know. You are correct on that. It's, so you have to be very cautious of, like you said before, the order and just getting it as fine tuned as you can. So you can do amount greater than and amount less than in the same rule and really like squeeze it in or amount equal exactly. You can play with a couple things like that. Yep. So now let me go edit this because for some reason, I don't know why the payee is just not. That is a, it's a default that's in the program right now. Um, if you actually go ahead and save it, now don't click back into it. If you look on the screen itself, if you expand that field, you'll see it's actually setting it. But every time you go to, to look at it, it clears out the payee name as if it's not saving it. Okay. Well now when I went back in and did it, now it seems to be sticking. So that's clearly a bug. But you see now it sticks. So after creating the rule, I went back in, edited it, set the payee once more, and then it's stuck in there. We also talk about the silliness of well, clicking to edit. What you scroll down a bit. Why do you have assign more? And then it's only, ah, okay. Class location or memo. Okay. Yep. I must have been in a file the other day that didn't have class or location. And so it just popped up uh, 
memo. I was like, well, why didn't you just leave that as a field there? Yep. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this rule. Watch this trick. And we're going to call this. Ah, come on. Honda repairs, right? Or we'll just call it. Well, yeah, let's just say Honda repairs. And then all I'm going to do is change this condition to amount doesn't equal 695, right? The, so the, it's very unlikely that we're going to bring the car in for repairs and it's going to, and the bill's going to be exactly $695, right? If nothing else, there's going to be sales tax on the parts. So it's very, very unlikely. So I, in, in any case, I found this rule works. So now I have the second rule that says if it's anything other than $695, then we're going to go to auto repairs and maintenance, right? Which here I just have a, a general auto expenses account. So I'll just use that and save. Okay. So now let's get down to business. So now that's, again, a way to create the rules. Tiffany brought up a good point that there's sort of a better way to handle the lease. But in case for whatever reason you like my way of doing it, then, uh, then that's what you can do. And I like doing the conditional logic in rules because it makes them more powerful and it makes the whole bookkeeping process more automated, right? So as much as possible, especially when I start out with a client, I want to you know, create as much of these rules as I can. That's sort of my philosophy now. As a new client, I'm going to spend a lot of extra time up front creating these rules because really I want to use the rules to substantially automate the whole bookkeeping process, right? And that way, and what I found, of course, is the more I do this in the beginning, the less and less time I need to put into it as time goes on. You know, usually I can then go into the bank, update it once a week. I can click all the ones that are recognized and usually get all but maybe four or five outliers in in about two clicks. And then I can go in and deal with the outliers and create rules for those, right? So now I want to clean things up. We're going to export rules. Okay, so I'll stick with the uh, the way that they name the file. I don't love the underscores. I prefer dashes. Again, that's my OCD, so just ignore me. So now it says switch to the company you want these rules for. From banking page, go to your rules list, click new rule, import. Oh, okay, that they're basically telling me what I was going to show you anyway. I thought maybe, Matthew, this was giving me... It's not a direct share. Yeah. It's, that's been, always been there. Yeah, I just never paid attention. The key thing to it is if you are utilizing as much of a universal chart of accounts as you can, where it stays consistent, yeah. as you go to do the import, it becomes very simple and it auto matches stuff. Yep. So let's get the Excel file in here. And of course, I'm going to hit enable editing. And then I'm going to click over here and I'm going to turn off the wrap text because that makes me nuts. So back in about 2014 or 2015, I nerded out on these things and figured out what each of these values were. Mm -hmm. So we could actually create a little widget in Excel and we can actually create one to 200 rules all at once just by populating in names and such and just spits out a full bank rules and we just upload them. It's kind of cool. Right. And you can figure a lot of it out by, as Matthew said, just taking your time and geeking out on this a little bit, right? So first you have rule conditions, so true conditions. Initially, I wouldn't know what on earth, you know, rule type 10 meant, right? Which banks? Right, which banks. So it's, I guess, value negative one means all banks, right? No, negative one is in money out. One oh, is that's money right, money in. out. Okay, and positive one would be money in. Okay, and so you can kind of tell by looking at this how it's structured. And then, of course, while you're in here, now you can sort by any column you want. Keep in mind that the sort order, when you go to import it again, is going to, you know, that's going to take precedent. So make sure that you have some kind of a way of managing the rules and understanding, you know, where there might be a conflict in terms of the conditions to make sure that your rules are in the right order afterwards. But, you know, going through this alphabetically can help in terms of finding what you're looking for and seeing maybe I don't need a particular rule. There's my Honda stuff now altogether. Initially, they were at the bottom because normally as you add rules, they just get added at the bottom, right? Yep. 
And so, and Matthew brings up a really important point about the fact that, you know, these rules are going to be specifying an account in the chart of accounts. So as much as possible, you, you know, what you really want to do here at this point is pull out the ones that are very specific to this client and won't necessarily apply elsewhere, right? And you want to be left with a group of sort of universal rules that you figure will work just about anywhere, right? So the next thing I want to do is, and first of all, if let's say, I, so let's say I clean this, these rules up, what I would want to do next is back in QBO, select all the rules, batch action. and then batch actions and delete them, right? Tiffany, that kind of answers your question. She wanted to know if importing will overwrite the existing rules. Yeah, it won't. No, it, it appends to them. Yeah, so you want to delete all the rules in here and then do the import. And of course, this will invite you to browse to that Excel file so that you can import the rules, right? Now, what I want to do is I want to create a library in Airtable so that I can build this library of sort of universal rules. And then, as is the case with Airtable, I can sort of categorize them so that when I want to, I can filter for a certain category of rules and then in Airtable, it's very easy to download a CSV in a particular view based on however I filtered it. And that will, in a sense, prepare that import file that I'll need to then pull it into QBO's bank feed rules for a particular client, right? So this is how this works. At, initially and at first, I have to make sure that my columns in Airtable sort of conform, right? So I need rule name. Let's go back to Airtable. That'll be column A, rule name. And I definitely want this to be the first column in Airtable because this is this first column is meant to be a unique identifier. So it should be the nature of what goes in this first column should always be something that would never be duplicated in the list. All right, then I want rule conditions. So we're gonna add a new column here and call it rule conditions. And single line text is fine for this. And I'll move that over. Seth, can you do like rep replacement uh, formulas inside of Airtable? What do you mean by replacement formula? Like if you wanted to change a portion of text on the inside of a, one of the cells. Oh, you mean like a find and replace? Yeah. Not exactly. There are parsing formulas where you could create a column to parse something and then kind of reconstruct it that way. So there are a lot of, like the, what I would say, Matthew, is play around with it because there are a lot of functions in Airtable. The only thing is, unlike a spreadsheet with Airtable, the formula that I create for a column has to apply to the whole column. In other words, I can't do a separate formula, you know, in different rows. So I basically, if I want to do a formula-based column, it's the whole column. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But they do have some really cool functions here that I haven't even taken the time that I'd like to really to learn it all. Okay, so now I've got the three basic columns, right? And then I'm going to insert a field to the left here, and we'll call this like a category or a category. Would that be like industry for companies so you know like different uses? Yeah, or how, you know, this can be anything you want. That's kind of the point, right? So in fact, you can do category industry, let's say. Right, and this we'll call it a single select. Where'd that go? Okay, and then I'll duplicate this field because I can do a different kind of category, you know, based on, I don't know, anything else. I'll call it category other for now, okay? And then what I'll do is I'll take this whole entire set, highlight it in Excel, Control C to copy. And then here I'll go Control V to paste. It's just confirming that I want to expand the table because I have many more rows in what I copied than what I have here. So I'll say continue. And so it's going to paste it all exactly as is in Airtable, right? And now you know, again, now you can have at it. So I can, you know, I can start creating industry-based categories, right? So Matthew, give me an industry. Porn. Uh, Porn. Plumbing. Really? What? I said plumbing. Oh, Adult I entertainment. Said porn. Sorry. Geez. Like... <laughs> okay, plumbing. I mean, they're not the same. Those, but... 
You guys are trying to get me in trouble. <laughs> you do it well. You, you got it, yeah. Yeah, I do a good job of that on my own. Yeah. We should probably also have a column for description so you can remember what that rule is set up to mm -hmm. do. All right, we'll do contractor. I'll do real estate just because I love real estate. Okay. And what I'm what I did by the way to get here, I kind of just did it without saying it is if you double click the column at the header, then that's where on a single select column type, you can start adding options. And you've also seen, I can color code these. And by the way, I can put these in any order I want. And, and if I sort by this column, it will use my order as the sorting order, right? Um, the other thing you can do, of course, is click here where it says alphabetize in case you just want it in alphabetical order, right? So click save. And I like Matthew's suggestion also. Hey, look, it's Josh. Is he like waiting to get in here or something? No. Okay. Um, I like your idea also, Matthew, of putting a description in here. So we have, I have a long text column type here for notes. Let's move that back over. Now, by the way, when you start getting a lot of columns like this and it, it can be unwieldy to click and drag it over, you can also click here where it says hide fields. There's more to this than it suggests. I can get in here and I can reorder things like this. Okay, the only thing you can't sort of touch is that first column. <laughs> right, so I can put notes here. Okay, and now this is by default, this was one of the fields that sort of came in by default when I created the blank air table thing. So by default, it's long text. You can change it to short text, right? But you might like the idea of having kind of a little notepad here that you can use to write notes about this, right? Now, what I might do for things like 76 and then Honda, and this is where, it's, you know, it's good to have multiple categories to go by. Let's just say I have auto expenses, right? Something like that. I mean, sorry, this is still meant to be category other. I wanted to create a choice called auto expenses, right? And then let's leave that out for now. And that of course comes into the drop down. auto expenses. Let's go find my Honda ones. That's these. You can start typing of course, and it will fill that in. So now I have auto expenses and just to quickly show you where I'm sort of headed with this is now that I've got a condition or a category rather applied, I can very easily come here and filter for and category could be, you know, like I could change this to like major expense category, something like that. But I can filter for only the ones that are categorized as auto expenses, right? Um, and then what I can do is I can, because this is still just a global view that has the notes, but ultimately I'm going to want to view, and let's just call this master list for a second. I want to create a view that's going to only include the columns that I'll want to import into QBO. This is why I love Airtable for this use case because it makes it easy to do exactly this kind of thing. So I'm going to go over here and click on this ellipsis and I'm going to say duplicate view. And this is going to be the import view. And the import view is going to hide the notes field, right? It's going to hide anything other than what I need for import purposes, which is just these three columns, right? So now I've got a view that's based on the filter I applied, auto expenses in this case, right? And now I can download this as a CSV. All right, table one import, click that. And boom, so now I've got a file that's exactly ready to import the exact rules I want. Okay, and in the outputs, of course, we would want to double check this last piece here is the account, right? Value equals, uh, the value is auto, right? For the... Uh, Action type zero is, is the... Cabin. Yeah, it's weird that this one has it in a different order, right? Well, it's not really weird. It's just 
Action. You would think it would always be the same because in the other ones, I have the account for type zero first. And then, so type five is obviously the payee. Type zero is the account category or, or the expense account, right? But anyway, if I know that the file I'm going into with this has a different account name where I'd want this to go, I can alter this right here very easily. I, and I can call this auto repairs and maintenance, for example, if that's really where I want this to go. The order that will change as well if you add on classes or locations. There's also other variations if you want it to be a check, a deposit, expense, or a transfer right. as well. So what I'm going to suggest doing, and again, Airtable is kind of the perfect place for this, is let's create another table where I can create a log of the different designations that come in here and what they mean, right? So I'll have the outputs and what the different types mean. It'll be nice to start developing a, a library or within the existing library. Um, Matthew may already have that. Yeah, let me try to find it and I'll, I'll uh, share it. Beautiful. Yeah, because that's what I would do. And again, this is why I love Airtable because now table one is my rules. Additionally, something that Matthew shared with me, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but if you import that and your chart of accounts does not have auto, it will go to a field or go to a page where it says, okay, we don't see auto. What do you want this to be? So you I'll invite you to remap it. That's awesome. Yeah. If you, um, on my website, I have actually a set of universal rules for like um, ATMs where I set up these rules that would basically say if amount is greater than 20, but less than 39.99, set up the transaction as $20 for ATM and the remaining amount as a bank fee. And you would do in increments of like 20 each. Um, and the thought was by having it all set up, somebody can go grab it, import it, they can use them in their company file and all they have to do is just maybe map out what the account is in case they don't call it bank fees, they call it bank fee. And it really still is super easy to use. Right. And so what I'm starting to do now is I, you know, this column could be useful in terms of just saying, all right, well, these are based on, this is categorizing the rules based on the chart of accounts, you know, auto expenses, security for ADT, you know, Amazon is kind of a specialized thing because it can be so many different things, you know, so you can use this because I can, I can filter it based on any of these, right? So, you know, and what I might want to do for industry is actually make this a multi-select, right? Because now I can say, well, you know, this would apply to any of them. Right, so I have auto expenses and so I thought I changed it, hold on. So multiple select, save, there we go. Because then I can filter this and, and even though something has, you know, multiple categories, I can still filter it for one particular category. And I can, I have these other kind of options. So it can be, if it has any of these or it has all of these or exactly just one, right? And then if I do the any of, for example, I can say, well, I want any, any rules that I've decided apply to contractors and uh, plumbing, which is really kind of a specialized type of contractor, right? So of course I have to have something applied there. But the point is, and the reason I love Airtable for this purpose in general, is that I can do all this kind of stuff. Like in terms of categorizing things, I can really get detailed about this and I can create as many columns as I want. You know, ultimately what we're trying to get to is a way of filtering these rules so that I can, you know, export exactly and only the things I want. So for example, the auto would probably be all of them. And AAA is really just another, that's why I put it to auto expense in that next column, right? And by the way, similar to Excel, you know, where you can adjust the row heights, uh, Airtable has this option. It's not quite as, uh, you know, dynamic where you can set it to any width you want, but you have options. So I don't like these, ex you know, like the extra tall, I don't like having all this extra space, but again, that's just my OCD. 
So, but just, I want, you, I want you to be aware that you have this. So if it starts bugging you that you have like all these categories and you can't see everything at once, you can use this icon right here to adjust the row heights in Airtable. Right, but I'm hoping that what you can see here is like here's box.net, so for category, and you can add categories on the fly to these, right? That's what I did, so this. Could you, that, Beth, you, you could, could set up, oh, sorry, you could set up a table of the chart of accounts and then you can. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you can do the same kind of thing with the chart of accounts, so you can create a library of charts of accounts that you can specify for different industries and what have you, absolutely. Um, can you can you grab the category just like with a formula straight from the rule? You know, the, like because the rule because the rule has the category in the line, right? Yeah, not easily because again, you would have to kind of parse that part of the rule out to be able to look it up. You'd almost be better off doing something like that in Excel. And even then, because we've already established that we can't guarantee what order this stuff is going to come in, like I can't assume it's going to be the last value, which okay. I would almost need to do. Like if I wanted to use like a, a right formula, you know, and say just take the the last, you know, 20 characters in from there, it's, 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 it would be more work than it's worth probably is what I'm trying to say. Right. Um, where was I on this here? So box.net, if I'm using chart of account categories, internet applications. And back to, I think that sounded like Alexa's comment about doing the chart of accounts. I can also create another table here, you know, call it chart of accounts. And so I'll do like auto expenses, internet applications. What else did I have here for category security, right? I'll just start with just a few simple ones. And then what I can do over here in rules is instead of doing the category this way, let me just add a new one. Because again, the beauty of this is I can create all the columns I want to do things in all the different ways that I want. So in this case, I'll say, first of all, let's call this um, chart of accounts. What we're going to do this is what's called a link to another record and we'll link to the chart of accounts, right? I don't want to allow linking to multiple records. I want one result in each row and click save. And then I can add lookup fields here. So that's newer because I didn't see this the last time I did this. So it looks like I can look things up based on different columns, but for now I'll just stick with name. Okay, so if it, so this is now linked to the chart of accounts and I can just pick, right? I can even just start typing auto if I know what I'm looking for. So it works much like a drop down in QuickBooks Online where I can start typing something and get what I need. So this would be another way, you know, perhaps more dynamic where you could, um, you know, set this up to be able to pull from your standard chart of accounts. So this is going back to what Matthew said also where, here you would start building kind of your standard chart of accounts and you would add in all the columns for type, whether it's a bank account or another current asset. So you can add another column for the account type, right? To kind of mirror exactly what goes on in QuickBooks online. So you can start, you know, using that as a linked uh, item over here to populate. You might even be able to create a formula that reconfigures the rule based on the account you've selected because you can do like a concatenate kind of formula. So you, you might be able to do something like that where you would look up type zero based on the account that you've chosen. Or maybe it's already been done. And that is why I was asking about the replace uh, formula earlier. Yeah, what I would be inclined to do is, so this would be the original rule output, maybe create another column <laughs> called new rule output, right? And you could write a concatenate formula that combines the the static parts of this with what needs to go in dynamically, such as the payee and the category. Because I don't suppose when you import it that the order that this stuff comes in matters? The structure, um, I haven't played with 
changing. The order is not exact, no. I mean, to some extent it is, but you have to have all of the commas and every, like everything else has right. to be Right, that part you can easily course. replicate. But in other words, if I did a concatenate where I would have all this stuff static, right, using just putting it in quotes in the concatenate formula, but then like here where it says triple A, that would be another piece of the concatenate formula that would pull from another column where I've got the payee, right? Yeah. And then over here, there would be another column that's got the category that would pull in the concatenate formula from that. So that way you could easily reconstruct this. There would have to be an assumption in place though that we're only dealing with payee and account and not you know class or location or any of that. Or you'd have to build it in for all, but then you have to deal with what does it look like if there is no class or location, right? So there's things to think about in terms of this, but it could definitely be done. Cause I, like I said, I can create yep. a, uh, a new field, right? So insert left and the type is going to be formula. Okay. And we'll call this a uh, new output. Okay. And the formula is going to be C O N C. So you just select that. Okay, and so in the first part, I would just put whatever needs to literally go in there first, right? So rule text stuff, Here. comma. Then I would choose, uh, I forgot to close the quote, that's why. Comma, then I would choose from a column like category, right? Not industry, but category chart of accounts. Okay, comma, quote, more rule, texty stuff, close quote, comma. So even though you have quotes as part of what needs to go in there, until I actually close the quote, or I believe if I put a second quote in here, it will treat this quote as a literal thing that needs to go in there. Let's test that and click save. You don't have matching quotes. What do you mean I don't have matching quotes? No, yeah, I purposely I put this in as, as though I wanted this to literally be a quote that goes in there, not not to close out the quote part. But let's see if removing that fixes it, because then that tells me, no, it still doesn't like it. Oh, you have a comma at the end also. Oh, yeah, it does. So now let's go back to that. So it may just not like me putting that extra quotes in there. So that could, that could that's going to be a problem because the the format of this includes some things that have double quotes in them. There's probably a way to do it that I would just have to play with. Right, but at least the rest of it we know definitely works. If I put something in here, um, like auto expenses, notice auto expenses comes in there, right? So we'd have to work on this formula a little bit but I feel like it could definitely be done. Let me try something here. Squirrel. Yeah, no, it's not liking the extra quote. So that's something we'd have to work on. But this is how I would start to approach doing, you know, what you talked about, Matthew. The quote part of it, not to go back to it, but it could possibly be when you're using text, if you you use quotes on the inside, that actually changes formulas sometimes. That, say that again? Um, in formulas, if you have the quotations, that can actually change the way the formula reads it inside. Just well, no, definitely. And that's the whole problem is because the concatenate formula uses the quotes to determine what the literal stuff is that you're going to put in the result. So put another set of brackets outside of it. So, of no, I think what you'd have to do is probably use single quotes in the formula. And then once you get that into Excel, you can probably, you know, do a search and replace on the single quote to a double quote. Because what I've just determined here is when I try to put an extra quote in there, which I thought it would say, okay, well, I've got this extra quote. So I'm just going to treat that as part of the text that needs to go in. I thought it would look at it that way, but it doesn't. So I'm not sure how to approach that. The good news is Airtable's got a lot of like support forums and Facebook groups where you can go in and I can probably in about 30 minutes find somebody who's dealt with this and find out what their solution was.
but this is definitely how you could begin to approach that, like I said. So if I wanted to wrap this in single quotes for now, I could do that, but and that works. But now let's make sure, and I'm looking at the initial rule outputs, and there's nothing that uses single quotes. So in theory, that could work, where you would use single quotes where this requires double quotes, and then once you've exported it to the CSV, you can do a quick, a quick search and replace, replacing single quotes with double. That would be the workaround for now on that. And then, so Matthew, what is this craziness you've pasted into the chat? Um, that is one of the actual formulas so the stuff you're talking about doing, I created this in Excel uh, with the VBA and mm -hmm. have it set up where that is the formula itself that you would use. And then you basically have different columns to find and basically find and replace. So you can just put uh, the actual vendor name in a different cell and it automatically just changes all the way through. And then you can click a button and say that you want to add class on or take lists or everything else. I thought maybe the organization that might have helped what you were going towards is why I was trying to share that part. I see. But what is pound pound dot COA dot vendor? Like I don't recognize this in terms of what kind of a formula this would be in Excel. VBA isn't it? Or this is the VBA code you wrote. Okay. Um, yeah, it's VBA code. And then part of what's in here is the ability to switch out pieces because of what you were just talking about. So if you like look for substitute, uh, that second section, you'll see where it's got the, the brackets with pound, pound. Um, that pound, pound would be two initials. Um, gotcha. Trying to make it unique and it kind of goes through. So the pound, pound dot COA dot vendor, that's the actual name of the rule, right? And it replaces the pound, pound with the initials. COA would be the account. The vendor would be the other part. Gotcha. And then as it does that, it uses those values to automatically fill in what needs to go into the actual uh, cell to create the, it's a dynamic formula basically at that point. Gotcha. Okay, cool. You do that in Google Sheets? I can. I need to learn how to write Google script. It's the same right, thing as actually. VBA. It's just Google's version. So there. <laughs> so everybody get the gist of it? So if you're not a VBA programmer like Matthew, you might want to try the Airtable approach. <laughs> um, or you can get with Matthew and, and see if and how Matthew can help you get access to his spreadsheet version. I'm sure he'll sell it to you for the low price of... $4 billion. $4 million. Yeah, $4 million sounds about right. I am actively trying to find right now where I've got the... Um, in my history of files the the different pieces the bank rules so i can get it over to you seth so I should. okay cool very cool so that's it that's pretty much my story and i'm sticking to it but like i said i like Airtable because it's a very dynamic database where i can you know like i showed you carve out the import view after i filtered it for the things that i want i can go to that import view and then uh you know, dump that into a CSV and then go into QBO and choose the import option in the rules area. And I can quickly and somewhat seamlessly get my sort of baseline of rules for any new client imported into QBO in, a, you know, in minutes so that I don't have to sit there recreating the rules and spending what sometimes translates to a month or two of doing bank feeds before you get all your rules set up again. So this definitely saves a lot of time if you build a library like this. Seth, real quickly, since we have a couple moments, I just put a link in the chat, which it's to my, an article I have on the rules, but I wanted to actually direct you where to go to grab and download the universal rules I was talking about for like the ATM. Okay. Um, Cause I wanted to see if we can try to import those so people can see those last couple steps of what it looks like. Okay. Uh, so where tell, help me out here. Where I, I see the article, but where am I going exactly? Um, you're going to scroll down. So right there. You click on the download. Yep. That or the other one. I forget which one it is. 
that should be perfect. And then it will download, and then you should be able to just kind of pull these in. Notwithstanding the fact that you're going to have different accounts here than I've got. But that's actually the reason why I wanted to show this to you is I want people to see what the import process looks like sure. um, and kind of get a feel for how it's done. Yeah, these were actually done as checks, but. Gotcha. Oh, look at like automatically resized everything. Did you do that? Is there VBA in here? Nope. No, it's not macro enabled. Hey, you just happened to, because it was all highlighted, you double clicked it. I think it ex expanded it. Oh, out. it just delayed it, maybe. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. So let's do this. Now I forget, does it have to be CSV or can it um, import? This is actually formatted just for this. And this one actually, what this import was is we would do it for like a check import. Um, so when when you're playing in Excel, if you're messing with the transactions, you can always add something to the end of the memo and use that to actually trigger rules also if you wanted. Um, perfect. So as you click in and then do next, please work. It's been a while. So now you can see basically it started to automatically pull and suggest where these different things should go. On the next tab, um, so two of them were rules that basically wouldn't go through and you will, it doesn't show you necessarily, but this is the area I wanted to be able to, be able to show everybody. It's so mapping. Yeah. Super, super easy. So if you had a universal chart of accounts, it would literally fill in everything for you. Almost everything. So you can add them on if you needed to, or even if they're random across company files, this still can be much faster to use this. And then once the rules are in, you're good to go. Um, and you don't need to map them all. I just want to show at least that page. Oh, no, I got to map them all now, Matthew. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. But yeah, so I didn't have professional fees in this sample company. So I'm just creating that really quickly. Part of it is when you have the parent sub account, trying to make sure that those map out exactly the right way. Right. So, so in here, like, so sometimes I've done this with a uh, client's accounts or I didn't bother breaking it out. Just, I just, one thing for all professional fees, because I can drill in from the PNL and group it by payee to see what was a lawyer and what was an accountant and so on. And especially when they started imposing limits on the number of accounts you can have, that became something I did even more of. Yeah. Anyway, so everybody gets the idea. So I would finish mapping and then it would let me continue on to do the import and then it would import those rules. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So that's it. Anybody else? Any questions? All right. I'll take the silence as a resounding no. Anybody going to try this? Anybody going to take Airtable? I did ask it? a question on my form today. What? I asked a question on my form today. You asked the question on your form today, you lost me. For registration, you have to ask a question at the bottom that you always forget to review. If oh, you're... I didn't. Yeah, I never look at that anymore because I usually just had like Laura Sabay asking me what color socks I was wearing. So let me oh, take a look. Are you not wearing socks? I, I usually am wearing socks. Otherwise, my feet get cold. But Laura, in the past, has really liked to ask me if I was, and usually I would respond by saying I'm wearing red socks. I think I've, I've asked how much wood could a woodchuck chuck if a wood could. <laughs> but you've never answered the question. So. Well, I stopped checking those answers because it had been a long time since I actually got a serious one. So now I'm going to go take a look. I'm going to, can I share my screen while sure. doing that looky loo? This is a. Um, are you sure you asked it on this webinar, Matthew? Because I don't have anything in the questions. It would be under the bank memo master. No, there's no. I have a whole column for ask me anything and I'll answer during the show, and it's blank. What a bummer. So yeah. I don't think your question went through here. Maybe it was for a different one that you registered for. Okay. So this had the different iterations of all of the rule stuff. Um, money in, money out, what the variations actually mean. 
So your um, rule type like six is actually bank text contains, bank, um, bank text is exactly, so forth. Um, action types, this has been a long time since I've looked at this, but um, I will be happy to share this if it helps anybody anyway. And then we mapped them all out to really fully understand like every single potential one with our chart of accounts basically. So if anybody wants to nerd out on that, just shoot me a nerd message and I will share it. Send it to me. I want it. Okay. I definitely want to We're working on this right now. It's like been my thorn in my side. So we I, have the standard chart of accounts. We have the vendors. I can like export just the, the vendors from all my clients, but I just am missing that piece of, to get it all in. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Then I'll do that. I'll even show you how to like use it if you want. Because <laughs> here's a hey, whole bunch of pieces. Figure, yeah. Try to figure out how to put it together. <laughs> I'm pretty good at that. That's one of my favorite things to do, actually. Yeah. Yep, it's fun geeking out on this stuff, especially yeah, when it's stuff right. that's going to save you a lot of time once you're once you figured it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, and I I just thought of a way potentially to make that formula work on Airtable with the double quotes. I'm going to try this, but where you just create a column that has one double quote in it and you can keep referencing that column in the formula wherever there needs to be a double quote inside the concatenate formula. So I think a reference to a column will not crash the concatenate. And again, the difference, the reason you would use the air table versus what Matthew has is for Matthews, you need to really know what you're doing in terms of the VBA stuff. <laughs> I, I would not wish it to anybody. You do not want to spend a day in my brain with this kind of stuff. It's, <laughs> it's a deep hole. Yeah, so the Airtable version would be the sort of simple way to do it, I guess you could say. 